Now, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, energy efficiency. And if you look at energy efficiency, uh, many of the devices that we talk of for energy efficiency, for instance, an energy efficient motor as compared to the standard motor, you would find that the initial cost of the energy efficient device is slightly higher, but most of these energy intensive devices, the operating cost is far exceeds the cost of the initial purchase. For instance, if you look at a 20 horsepower motor, uh, the initial cost of a 20 horsepower motor is just 45,000, is 45,000 rupees. An energy efficient motor may be slightly costlier, let's say at 60,000. However, the annual cost of electricity to run that motor continuously is about 6 lakhs. And in the case of the energy efficient motor, this runs out to be uh, 5 lakhs and so they get much more than this benefit in terms of doing this. The problem often is that when you implement a motor, it is one of the loads of the total. So we never track what is happening in terms of the benefit that we are getting. And this is uh, one of the difficulties which happens with this. Uh, so many of these, whether you look at incandescent lamps, boilers, uh, the energy, the operating cost uh, far outweighs the uh, cost. And, and that is why we would like to look at it from a life cycle point of view. So this is from a German study which shows that how do we remove the obstacles for energy efficient motors. And uh, there are a whole set of different policies which can be done. So, there are in the case of motors, there are these original equipment manufacturers. For instance, in textiles and many of these industries, they buy the process equipment where the electric motors are part of the, the equipment. So, in this, if we can have voluntary agreement standards and labeling, uh, then in the case of uh, the buying by the large industry, there are consultants and then there are Again, labeling, information, subsidies and duties, campaigns for replacing inefficient equipment, uh, again the information, auditing, environmental taxes, uh, create incentives for new product development, marketing by motor manufacturers, so that you can have the energy efficient motor being the major stream where people rework their entire manufacturing and then the cost differential will also come down. So there are a whole host of things and these kind of analysis can be done for almost all the energy efficiency options. Now let's look at the last, uh, 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 another example, uh, no, before we do that let me look at another energy efficiency example. I talked to you about the perform, achieve and trade. And this was a scheme which was launched by the Bureau of Energy Efficiency and the idea was the large energy intensive industries were targeted as designated consumers. Uh, there were discussions with each of these stakeholders and for all of them the total amount of energy which is being used was calculated. The specific energy consumption that means the energy consumed per unit of product was calculated and uh, there were set targets in terms of how much they should reduce the specific energy consumption. Now in this, the problem which was there is that the whole industry has a set of different kinds of, there are small players, there are large players, there are efficient players, there are inefficient players, there are older um, companies and uh, plants and there are the new and efficient plants. And so the idea was that uh, the, the target was distributed amongst the whole segment in a certain way. And uh, this was done through a set of, so for each, each of these there was a consultation document and a process. So in the case of cement we are looking at each of these the output was put in terms of tons of cement. Uh, fertilizer it was developed in terms of tons of urea, so the energy use per ton of urea energy use per ton of cement, energy use per ton of crude steel, uh, sponge iron, uh, alumina, molten aluminum, pulp, paper, fabric, yarn, caustic soda, electricity. You can look at the uh, document for further details. So for instance, if there are a number of plants and the last three years of data was collected with the average production and their energy consumption and then Amongst these plants, 
the total consumption was taken and the, uh, the best plant was taken as the relative SEC specific energy consumption which is the lowest was taken as one and correspondingly the others were divided in terms of the ratio of the specific energy consumption. So, the plant which had uh, the highest, see if this had uh, let us say 40 percent higher specific energy consumption, whatever target was set overall, this would have a higher target of 1.4 x, while the plant which had 1 would have only x. We add this up and then the total target was put in terms of a percentage and then attributed divided against amongst the each of these plants, so that there was a differential target with the ones which were more ineff inefficient having to uh, set a higher target compared to those which are already more efficient. And in this, in this the idea is that there would be designated consumers, there would be a nodal agency which would uh, audit and uh, specify what is the consumption and uh, monitor this. Uh, and then uh, the, there would be an exchange and a registry and uh, the market regulator would be the Bureau of Energy Efficiency. So, the idea was that everyone would have over a three year cycle a target. If you um, achieve your target that is fine, if you over achieve you get a certificate which you can trade and sell, if you under achieve you either buy the certificate or you pay a penalty and this is how this was uh, sort of um, proposed. Um, the, the steps were that the steering committees were created and structured, and this was uh, approved, it was approved by the cabinet and sectoral uh, committees were appointed, baseline data was collected and then rules and notified and the designated consumers. So, for instance, if you look at an iron and steel plant, we can look at the different kinds of processes, the total energy input electricity solid fuels all of them put into an equivalent term and then divided by the production output to get the specific energy. So, the idea was that it was not feasible to de define a single norm and uh, each uh, unit would have would be targeted based on its past performance and its uh, specific energy consumption within the band of all the units uh, in that sector. And uh, so, then uh, if you see this the ones which are gold will only um, um, will only uh, have to save 1.5 percent on a three year basis, the ones which were inefficient will have to go as high as 7.5 percent. And so, this is the way in which this happens. Uh, just to give you an idea, the specific energy spread for instance in the pulp and paper sector, you can see there is a wide range of uh, specific energy consumption of these uh, 19, uh, 17 uh, units and you can see then that the, the targets have been set accordingly. Uh, these have been clustered based on the type of um, uh, type of uh, feedstock or the type of uh, product and then uh, targets have been set. So, as we as I told you earlier, we have this possibility of uh, if we meet the target is fine, this is the baseline, this is the target. If we, um, we are below the target means that means we have overachieved, we get certificates for this amount. If we underachieve, we can either purchase the certificates or pay the penalty and the penalty was uh, twice uh, the amount of cost that would have been incurred if you had uh, done that saving. And then this, there are many issues, verification by energy auditors, specific energy consumption and the normalization factors. So, this has been implemented in a certain way, the next phase is happening where this is being broadened and deepened and the question the market is also, market has not yet developed, but the first stage of uh, doing this has happened and this has increased at least the awareness in terms of the uh, energy consumption in the industrial sector. Uh, another set of, um, uh, we talked about the renewable energy certificates very similar to the PAT. Here what has happened is earlier we used to have this preferential tariffs where we got for renewable energy we would give a preference in terms of a higher feed in tariff. Uh, now instead of this, now the idea is that the electricity is sold at the distribution company as the price at which it would normally be bought. 
and you get a certificate saying that we have generated X megawatt hours of renewable energy, renewable electricity and that renewable electricity can be sold to obligated entities which will meet their uh, renewable purchase obligations. And this has sort of, there was a, the idea was that this, these certificates would be traded but unfortunately the uh, supply and demand matching of this was not there so it was actually just hovering around the floor and there was not much uh, movement on this. Uh, but this is, uh, as things m progress, the renewable energy certificate mechanism may work. So the idea in this is that this RECs will be going to the power exchange and the state load distribu uh, SLDCs, the renewable energy generators and obligated entities can work on it. Uh, uh, we talked to you, when we d discussed financing, we looked at this mechanism where we were talking in terms of uh, leasing and uh, I talked to you about this example of Ahmedabad Electricity Company where you had uh, the manufacturer actually leasing the capacitors and uh, getting paid from the electricity bill. A similar kind of concept was uh, adopted in the scheme for the um, this compact fluorescent lamp, budget lamp yojana and the idea in this was that uh, lamps would, the prices of lamps would be brought down uh, and it was of course based on the fact that the CERs would be sold at a price. Um, the earliest concept of the energy service company actually dates back uh, to James Watt and his steam engine. Uh, at that time, so this was the idea is that we have this concept where an energy service company comes in and says that you continue to, you are now paying a certain amount for your energy, we will come in and we will, you continue to pay, you pay a little less, so you save let us say 10 percent, we will implement energy efficiency as a service and we will charge you for that and so percentage of the savings will come to us. You benefit because you are getting uh, a lower bill, we benefit because we are getting a profit out of it. Uh, so uh, this kind of concept has uh, been tried and the, uh, this was earliest was in James Watt where he says we will leave a steam engine free of charge to you, we will install these and take over for five years the customer service. So the whole uh, operating risk is with this. this is especially true for new industries and, and steam engine, we guarantee you that the coal for the machine costs less than you spend at fodder on the horses which do the same work. So earlier it used to be horse driven mechanical work and everything we require is that you give us a third of the money that you save. So one third and two third, one third coming to James Watt's company and two thirds going to the company. So this is the concept of the energy service company somewhat successful in the Indian context, not that successful because many of the industry, the energy service company has to, to get the financing and do a lot of these risks. Uh, now let us talk about the last example and that is about uh, nuclear. Uh, we will talk about uh, nuclear as you may know everyone usually has a view on nuclear, uh, Some many people are positive in terms of nuclear, some people feel that there are problems with nuclear. In the case of nuclear, from a carbon point of view, it is a low carbon option uh, and uh, it does not have any emissions with that there in terms of CO2 or local emissions. However, the problem is with radiation and these are usually large plants and there is a containment area and the problem are with um, public acceptance, problem in the case of accidents and in the case of accidents uh, there is a very low probability of an accident but if the accident occurs there is a very high probability of damage. So the question is from a societal viewpoint how do you analyze that and how do you compare this. There are safety risks both in terms of the fuel cycle and the power plant. There are also problems in terms of nuclear waste disposal of high level waste and problems in terms of proliferation, weapons and missile materials. Uh, the advantages in terms of climate change and there are some issues related to cost. Costs are quite uh, high in the case of uh, nuclear. 
So let us just look at uh, some of the things and there is uh, there are some estimates of the costs of damages to persons, goods and environment. And um, these are in the two accidents, the Fukushima and the Chernobyl accidents, these were the kind of um, damages, uh, 187 billion euros and 450 billion for Chernobyl. Uh, now one of the issues we, which has been there in terms of policy has been the liability laws. We had this agreement which was called the 123 agreement so that we can actually be part of the nuclear suppliers group and so that foreign companies can supply and the question was should we be limiting the liability. So these are the, the kind of operators liability and the limiting uh, and uh, in the case of in the case of India we signed an agreement where the operator liability limit is to 1500 crores operator shall have a right to recourse where the nuclear incident, so the supplier liability is limited and only the operator will have a right to recourse where the nuclear incident has resulted is a consequence of an act of the supplier or his employee which includes supply of equipment or material with patent or latent defects or substandard services. So only if this is proved then only there will be a liability and this liability was limited. And so the idea was in the Indo-US deal was that there is a nuclear liability fund with an insurance cover and the idea was this insurance premium will come from the electricity supply price which means of course that it will cost, it will result in an increase in the electricity use, uh, increase in the electricity cost. We have had another recent plants which have been there, Kulan Kulam, Tamil Nadu, you can see 2000 megawatts at about 17,000 crores. Jaitapur in um, Ratnagiri district, France, about 9.3 billion US dollars, fairly uh, high in terms of the cost. Now what has been happening is over a period of time because of these perceptions and this, um, the, uh, the Japan for instance had a significant amount of nuclear generation and uh, based on the um, problem and the uh, uh, Fukushima uh, accident, uh, the, there has been a setback in terms of nuclear generation in Japan. Uh, in most of the countries, the regulation has mandated more controls and uh, also many of the power plant nuclear generators are not functioning, um, uh, are not uh, increasing the number of uh, equipment. So the costs, unlike in the case of uh, solar and wind where you see a learning curve and the costs have been declining, uh, you can actually see in many of these cases the US average and the French average that the capital cost has been increasing and uh, this is because of uh, more regulations, more stringent uh, mechanisms and control mechanisms and you can see that this is the uh, this is the range minimum to maximum and then this is the kind of thing. Of course people are talking in terms of uh, more inherently safe nuclear reactors and there are uh, people are also talking in terms of breakthroughs in nuclear uh, both in terms of s smaller reactors and there is also research going on on nuclear fusion. In our context we have been looking at uh, now thorium as a feed source stock but uh, the whole issue in the case of nuclear is a question of addressing the, cons the perception and the reality of risks and uh, putting, uh, seeing whether this is societally acceptable or whether there are options. Uh, but this could be one of the cases where we can look at uh, nuclear to meet some of the uh, base loads. Uh, with this we conclude this section on energy policy. We have looked at uh, different examples, we have talked about the framework for policies, we have looked at different kinds of policy instruments and different metrics. Uh, we have looked at um, air pollution, we have looked at our uh, uh, Paris commitments, uh, we have looked at access, uh, cooking, uh, energy efficiency, PAT and uh, no, the nuclear uh, uh, agreements. Uh, so you can look at many other 
different policies which are being uh, launched by the government uh, and also at the international level and you can try and put all the components that we have learned in this course uh, to analyze these policies and then also you can propose what would be the appropriate policies for different contexts.